live stream Aganza number 157, which, I don't know, it feels prime. I Do you know? It, I don't you know. Didn't, you didn't I didn't look did, it up. I... All right. So let's, uh, we'll just in our head, we'll check all of the possible factors and see if any of them uh, go in. And um, I think it probably is. That's my guess. I don't know. <laughs> I feel I'm, I'm feeling unprepared today. Uh, we're going to talk about antibodies. We're going to talk about the Department of Defense, the problem with the field, the journal Nature, the American, um, um, what exactly are they called? The, sorry, something about, yeah, the American Academy of Pediatrics hmm. and um, some other fish. I like actually fishy fish. Fishy fish. Yeah, yeah that's All how, the rest of it uh, was fish talk because humans being know. fish and all, but yeah. this, is, this is what more like what people think of when you say fish to them. This is, it, it, people will be somewhat uh, surprised and maybe disappointed to discover that this is how when we were teaching and the entire room was full of people who knew that people and other tetrapods are in fact just as entitled to be called fish as uh, any of the things that you might find at a fish market, um, that we used fishy fish to designate those things that look the way the mind thinks a fish ought to look. And fish, more generally, could refer to any of those tetrapods. Yes. So this week on Dark Horse, fish. Fish. As usual. As usual. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a distinction that you can use to annoy almost any of your friends. <laughs> yes. Well, fish at the Department of Defense, of Defense at the Journal Nature, in the field, as yeah. fish will be. Actually, you know, you can understand their behavior, often disappointing in and of itself, much better if you think of them as fish, right? In fact, they are Ooh. almost all of the all of the people who do disappointing things. Oh, yes. yes. Except that we're all in it together. We are all in it this together. Is, this is, in fact, part of the problem here, isn't it, guys? We're all in it together. And uh, we need to remember that. We need to act like it's true. It gets really, really hard when some people are uh, insistent that it's not true and all that has to happen is you need to get rid of, like, you know, Half the population, it will be fine. Right. No, that, yeah, there's a lot of that style of thinking, and it keeps reemerging. But um, it really does. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess we'll just uh, a brief PSA <laughs> don't fuck it up. It's our planet, too. Thanks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's been brought to you by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. By, by fish who have seen the writing on the wall, which is something that some fish do. And, See uh, and write and build walls. Exactly. Mm -hmm. oh. Not all fish do any of those yep. things. Yes. Is there anyone still watching? <laughs> <laughs> it's not two or three. Uh, yeah, it's not the kind of fish we're going to be talking about today. But um, cave fish have this toggle. They can go between eyedness and eyelessness, not within an individual, but in one generation, uh, depending on whether or not they are in fact in caves where there is no light and therefore no need to uh, no need to have eyes and the eyes are back to liability. Or, you know, the ceiling of the cave is collapsed and now there's light and it would be really useful to have eyes after all. You can get them back. Yeah. 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 It's cool. You can. Biology be cool like that. <laughs> it, 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 it do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we both bat botched the grammar in two different ways, but um, okay. Fi uh, logistics at the top of the hour, followed by our sponsors, and then we'll get into the meat of the discussion today. The fish, which is debatably meat. Never mind. I'll get off the fish thing now, and we can just go straight to the fishiness of all of the stuff that's taken place. Yes. You can find and follow Dark Horse now on uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. And um, and do that, do that. Get announcements about upcoming shows and such. We follow these live streams, of course, as always, as usual, as many times with live Q and A's. You can ask your questions at darkhorsesubmissions.com. You can watch right now if you're watching live. If, even if you're not watching live, you can watch on YouTube or Odyssey. Odyssey has the chat live on it, and there is an active chat going on. We can't see it, but you can if you choose to. Uh, you, we always encourage you to check out Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century, uh, which is coming out in many, many new languages this year. Uh, but the original in English is the one that we wrote. And uh, the translations are, we presume, awesome, but we can't assess those as directly. And um, of course, every week or nearly every week, uh, we've, I've got something new on natural selections. And this week I posted on some of the surprising, even, even to us, surprisingly like critical roles uh, that beavers play in uh, in landscape maintenance and development, and you know we, we can ask questions about what 
the first Americans might have seen as they emerged onto this um, maybe partially, maybe completely, depending on when and who exactly, ice-free landscape of North America, and how much less prone it was to fires and droughts and, and floods, uh, largely due to the uh, activity of beavers. So, so check one, that out. So one correction, you said the roles the beavers play, they think of it as work. They, they, they do, I guess, on the other hand, uh, not having language, like so many fish, uh, they we can't ask them what they prefer. We, well, but see, beavers have this um, this mechanism for uh, displaying displeasure, and it's really unambiguous. And the first time you hear it, you think, "What the hell has happened?" Mm-hmm. The slapping of the tail on the on the water surface. So we could try it out. We could say this around them and see whether it gets a, uh, a negative review. Yes, that presumes a lot about what they can understand, of course. <laughs> Uh, we we have a store at darkhorsestore.org with uh, with great products like one our producer, our 18-year-old son, is wearing right now the Lie to a Tyrant hoodie, uh, which he is not probably going to display, but if he wanted to just uh, scoot past, he could. Uh, it's, up, it's up to him. Okay, he says no. And, of course, we are sub- supported by our audience. Uh, we encourage you to subscribe to the main channel and the Clips channel, like, share, uh, both our full episode and and any clips that you think are particularly share worthy or share possible, and you know having been demonetized by YouTube over a year and a half ago at this point, uh, we have we uh, are reliant on the support and uh, the support of those who can afford it among our audience. You can join one of our Patreons. Right now, the question asking period is open at mine for the Q&A this month, the private Q&A that we do. Uh, when that Q&A is going to be is up in the air at the moment because there's all sorts of weird travel stuff happening last minute. Uh, but we will do it. And those questions are always a lot of fun. And for those, we are able to pay attention to the chat because they're they're really small. Uh, Brett has conversations on his, on his Patreon as well, which are fantastic, I hear. They are fantastic. They are... Uh, tight little groups of people who uh, we have a, a basically a running conversation that we make sure you can jump in at any point and then stick around as long as you like. Actually open to, to newcomers and new ideas, are you? Yep. Well, you know, I mean, the thing is, it's not entirely unlike what you and I experienced and did at Evergreen, where we often in the same class would have people who had taken three or four programs from one or both of us and uh, along with people who were just joining for the first time and you know uh i'm sure a one-room schoolhouse has its downsides but it also the idea of mixing people at different levels of understanding has spectacular benefits including uh, maybe most important among them that the need to bring people along who are new to the conversation keeps the conversation from becoming some jargon-filled right. uh, niche where only those who know the secret handshake can get in. And so... An academic conference, it's not. An academic conference, it's not. It's quite the opposite. So, uh, And I, I, I strongly recommend for anybody in any context where they have something highly technical or scientific to describe to figure out how to get it into English. And mm-hmm. um, anyway, an environment that forces you to do that as a matter of courtesy to people who uh, show up and are uh, smart and interesting but don't know the language yet, it's a great training tool. Nice. That's awesome. And also at both of our Patreons, you can get access to the Discord server where uh, people are hanging out a lot, talking, exchanging ideas, uh, having book clubs, sharing virtual drinks, uh, making plans in, uh, to meet in real life as well. And again, you can access that at either of our Patreons. And of course, we have sponsors. We carefully choose, we carefully vet and choose our sponsors. Uh, they are all products uh, or services that we actually and truly vouch for, even if, as with the first sponsor this week, it's not some it's not a product that we have specific need for, but we make sure um, that we know that it's an excellent product. So without further ado, our ads. <clears throat> our first sponsor this week is MD Hearing Aid. MD Hearing Aid makes high quality, simple and effective hearing aids for a tiny fraction of what most hearing aids cost. MD Hearing Aid was founded by an ENT surgeon who made it his mission to develop a quality hearing aid that anyone could afford. Most people who need a hearing aid only require a few settings, so he removed several less often needed components. 
MD Hearing Aid has sold over a million units and offers a 45-day risk-free trial and money-back guarantee. These hearing aids aim to fit so well that no one will know you're wearing them. The rechargeable batteries last up to 30 hours. Their Volt Plus model is water-resistant and up to 3 feet of water, and you don't need a prescription to get one. MD Hearing Aid has cut out the middleman, so you buy your hearing aid directly from the source, where audiologists and licensed hearing specialists are available seven days a week. Everyone can empathize with what it feels like to be left out of a conversation that others are enjoying. Here's a testimonial from a friend of ours who has substantial hearing loss and who relies on hearing aids. We asked her to try the product, and this is what she said. With my particular type of hearing loss, a deep male voice in a noisy room is the hardest situation for me to hear and understand speech. I wore the MD hearing aid to have a conversation with a deep-voiced man in a room with a lot of white noise. The MD hearing aid passed the test, as my conversation partner's voice was clear and understandable. At a price point of under $1,000, I was amazed at how effective they are. MD hearing aid is bringing affordable hearing to hundreds of thousands of people, people who might not otherwise be able to afford high-quality hearing aids. Get clinic-level care for 90% less with MD hearing aid. Go to mdhearingaid.com and use promo code DARKHORSE to get their new buy one get one deal. A pair of hearing aids costs just $149.99 and Dark Horse listeners also receive a free extra charging case, a $100 value. So head to mdhearingaid, that's m-d-h-e-a-r-i-n-g-a-i-d.com and use promo code DARKHORSE to get their new buy one get one deal, a pair of hearing aids, for only $149.99. Our second sponsor this week is Moink. That's Moo plus Oink. Moink. Moink is working hard to help save the family farm and get its customers access to the highest quality meat on earth. Fully 97% of the chickens served in the U.S. are dipped in chlorine, but family farms don't tend to do that, and the meat you get from Moink has never had that done to it. Founded by an eighth generation farmer, Moink delivers grass-fed and grass-finished beef and lamb, pastured pork and chicken, and wild-caught Alaskan salmon directly to your door. Moink farmers farm like our grandparents did, and as a result, Moink meets Moink meat, no, wow, wow. And as a result, Moink meat tastes like it should, which is to say, delicious. I was just salivating at the thought. Mm-hmm. Man, their meat is good. It, it really, really is. is good. <clears throat> Moink gives you total control over the quality and source of your food. You choose the meat delivered in every box, from ribeyes to chicken breasts to pork chops to salmon fillets. It's all fantastic, and you can cancel any time. We love everything about this company. The fact that the meat is grass-fed and finished on small farms the lovely publications that come along with it, and of course, the meat itself. Pork, beef, lamb, chickens, it's all completely delicious. Consider starting the new year, or treating someone else in the new year, to some truly fabulous meat, grown humanely and with care and fantastic for you. Shark Tank host Kevin O'Leary called Moink's bacon the best bacon he's ever tasted, and I agree. It's amazing. Keep American Family going by signing, signing up at moinkbox.com slash darkhorse right now, and listeners of this show will receive free filet mignons for a year. That's one year of the best filet mignon you'll ever taste, but for a limited time. Spelled M-O-I-N-K, box.com slash darkhorse. That's moinkbox.com slash darkhorse. Are we pronouncing it wrong? Moink? Moink. How would you pronounce it? I think that is probably the better way to pronounce it, but it's harder to spell. <laughs> you know, granted, I hadn't gotten that far, but... Yeah. All right. Yeah, that's um, me always putting, you know, cold water on your enthusiastic creative outburst because hard to spell. Because hard to spell. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I never thought that this writing the stuff down was a good idea in the first place. Didn't that you? was somebody else's. You came rather a little bit too late to that party. I couldn't too. stop that train. It was already mm-hmm. uh, invented for one thing. Indeed. Um, yep. All right. Our final sponsor this week is Vivo Barefoot, who makes shoes made for feet. Regular listeners will be familiar with Vivo by now, but if you're not, you are in for a treat. Seriously, try these shoes. Most shoes are made for someone's idea of what feet should be. Vivos, however, are made by people with feet who know how to use them. Here at Dark Horse, we love these shoes. They are beyond comfortable. The tactile feedback from the surfaces you're walking on is amazing. They cause no pain because there are no pressure points forcing your feet into odd positions. They're fantastic. Our feet are the product of millions of years of evolution. That's like three million years of upright evolution, which if my math is correct, is like 26 billion hours of upright evolution. All right. (laughs) You at least didn't spot a flaw. In the calculation. I think the chances you landed on the right number are low. Are very, very well, low. Well, we are yes. going to hear about it if I did. Also, I'm not, I don't know, 3 million? 
of upright evolution. I picked a particular ancestor, and we can, oh, okay. uh, over dinner, we will discuss whether I've got the right ancestor to begin the question of human foot evolution. Yeah. Right? Okay. But I digress. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Often. Um, humans evolved to walk, move, and run barefoot. Modern shoes that are overly cushioned and strangely shaped have negatively impacted foot function and are contributing to a health crisis. People move less than they might, in part because their shoes make their feet hurt. Enter Vivo Barefoot. Vivo Barefoot shoes are designed wide to provide natural stability, thin to enable you to feel more, and flexible to help you build your natural strength from the ground up. Foot strength increases by 60% in a matter of months just by walking around in them. The number of people wearing Vivo Barefoots is growing. Once people start wearing these shoes, they don't seem to stop. Vivo Barefoot has a great range of footwear for kids and adults and for every activity from hiking to training and everyday wear. They're a certified B Corp that is pioneering regenerative business principles and their footwear is produced using sustainably sourced natural and recycled materials with the aim to protect the natural world so you can run wild on it. Go to vivobarefoot.com slash darkhorse to get an exclusive offer of 20% off. Additionally, all new customers get a 100-day free trial so you can see if you love them as much as we do. That's V-I-V-O-B-A-R-E-F-O-O-T dot com slash darkhorse. Awesome. Um, 157 is prime. It is. It mm -hmm. felt prime, which know, often means nothing. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that is one of the ways that our brains uh, like to trick us, especially the bigger the, bigger the number, uh, the more likely we are to assume it's prime when it's not. I am imagining a great series in which the superhero's superpower is knowing what's prime just by looking at it. Wouldn't that be cool? No. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Back to the drawing board. <laughs> A, I feel like some people, you know, like math savants, have you know, effectively have this ability, right? And uh, and you know, maybe some people who aren't even savants who actually are, you know, have, have you know, it's it's not the one skill they have, but actually have a lot of skills and they're just really good at that thing. Yeah. Um, but I feel like, and you know, I'm not, I am not an expert on superhero culture mm -hmm. at all. Uh, but I feel like, in general, there has to be a practical use. For the superpower. Are you kidding? You don't think that's practical? So uh, you and I both remember from our childhood. Yes. The, the Wonder Twins. Oh, yeah. The Wonder Twins. Yes. Which were a, 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 a boy and a girl, a yeah. brother and a sister. Oh, wow, I just, no, it's actually would have been a boy and a girl. <laughs> Good. Nice and correction. I actually, <laughs> I actually can't remember what her, what she did. But uh, he, she would turn, she would turn into something. I think it was an animal. An animal. And then they like wonder twin powers activate and he turns into something made of ice or water. Made of any, any water. Kind of ice water. was could a be vapor, technically could be, acceptable. Yes. And, um, and it was such a, such a cheat and so awesome as well. Yes. It was a, it was an interesting experiment in but, constraints. But practical, even though um, unfounded in the land of like physics, as most superpowers are, I guess. Right. No, it's like, I mean, you know, you get you get to violate one law. It's like uh, your credit card. You get to pick one perk, you know, it can be miles. It can be uh, cash back or whatever. But superpowers is like credit cards, <laughs> he says. That's I guess we're done for the day. Yeah. That's that's what we came here to that's tell it. you. We've uh, we've accomplished it. We're, <laughs> it's going to be downhill from there if we keep going. So mm -hmm. anyway, it's been lovely. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you were going to defend your choice of superpower. As uh, being able to, uh, without thinking, say whether or not instantly prime. any number, no mm -hmm. matter how big. Um, I, I get what the superpower right, is. Right, right. I'm superpower. hoping that it will become suddenly obvious to you where your error was and how great a superpower that and would be. Then explain be. it to you. Yes, exactly. Okay. <laughs> that would be most appreciated because at the moment I'm struggling to come up with a, a value. practical Wait. application. Isn't there a practical application in uh, cryptography? Uh, granted, this is something I've always been a little vague on, but um, factoring numbers is the key to breaking hard encryption, I think. Well, we'll find out also in the comments when people write in and tell me that I don't know what I'm talking about. But I think perhaps the emergent superpower of being really awesome at breaking code might include as one of the more fundamental uh, sort of you know, fundamental superpowerettes 
uh, recognizing primes at a glance. I think we've done it. I think we have teamed up on a real legitimate superpower that would be of spectacular value. The code cracker. The... <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're envisioning this as a white superhero then? I was not. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to talk about antibodies? I, I suppose. <laughs> um, right. Well, actually, actually, you know what? Maybe, maybe we should start by talking about... No. <laughs> no, we'll come back there. Antibodies it is. All right. Um, I was inspired... <laughs> To uh, basically, here's the thing. I said something offhanded in response to Joe Rogan a couple weeks back. Was that a couple weeks? Boy, it doesn't feel like it. But I think it must have been. Week and a half? Yeah, week and a half, something like that. Anyway, he asked me a question. I've now forgotten what it was about antibodies. Um, And I said to him, I said, look, I think the the, um, concept of antibodies has loomed way too large in the public conversation over immunity in the context of COVID. And my guess is that the reason we have focused on antibodies is because the public knows what an antibody is. Yes, agreed kind of loosely. But hmm. um, but the point is, when you say antibody, um, it immediately conjures something, right? Whereas, you know, if you talked about almost any other concept, if I say clonal selection, right, which is a you know fundamental concept in immunology, almost nobody knows what you're talking about. So I do think that this is, it's almost a tell that suggests that what we are faced with is propaganda. So I don't, I haven't, I haven't listened to that part of the clip, and I, so I may stop me if this just isn't making no sense at all. But I, yep. but so your argument is that maybe part of the reason that we're talking about antibodies so much is simply because the the um, the public already knows what they are, and so is sort of ready to receive this sort of talk. But it feels to me like it's also true, and I haven't gone back and reviewed this at all. So. I may be wrong here, but it's also true uh, that antibodies are easier to to find in in the body. Um, like they're easier to test for than, say, T cells. And so, you know, we have we have clinical tests uh, that find the thing that's easy to measure uh, and that people already know about. So, I mean, it, it feels like it could be both. Unless, unless I'm wrong, but but I no, I you're think not. This is right, like. Right? You're not wrong. It's an easy. It's an easy assay. It's an e- yeah PCR, um, and it, you know, it's the it's the wrong thing to be doing, right? Uh, for for a number of reasons, but uh, those those two reasons, which have nothing to do with whether or not they're the right thing, make it the easy and um, publicly amenable thing to be talking about. Yeah, I, I get it. Right, um, it's something that we can talk about because we're more likely to have information about it because it's easier to come by that information. It's less arduous. I don't think that's really driving this um, at all. In fact, we can see even in the recent testing that was used, I think it was for the um, EUA for the childhood uh, so-called vaccines, where they had measured antibodies and claimed that that implied that these were very good at creating immunity to modern variants. And the point is there was a giant leap in there right? Which is, it's not clear. First of all, antibodies aren't what people think, right? This is, you're peering into a complex system and you are able to identify something and that is resulting in you saying, oh, there are a whole bunch of antibodies. And it doesn't inherently mean anything. In fact, antibodies can be negative. They can make the disease more capable of getting into your cells. So, um, anyway, I do feel like it is indicative of the propagandistic nature of our discussion that we are being presented with something that can then, you know, emerge into the conversation where people are then talking to each other about antibodies because they know a little something about antibodies. Whereas if you were talking about receptors on a T cell, they'd be scratching their heads. Well, what's a receptor? What is a T cell? Why would a receptor be useful in this battle? You know, so anyway, there is something weird about the focus on, on antibodies. And so anyway, I off the cuff said to Joe that I think it's about the, uh, the fact that the public knows what they are rather than the fact that that's where the conversation should be centered. And uh, then a friend of ours, uh, Jumi Kim, 
pursued this question. I did ask her, and she was at least somewhat uh, inspired to look into it because of my comment to Joe. Um, but anyway, what she came up with is very interesting, and I'll just sort of loosely say what it is. I would suggest everybody check out. Hey, Zach, can you show uh, Jumi's Substack post? Uh, one. Um, so I would suggest people uh, check out her Substack. She has done a bunch of these deep dives. And she's very good at doing this in plain English so that it's very accessible. She's highly capable as a biologist. So the technical matter is all right. She's not cheating on the technical stuff, but she presents it in a way you can understand why she reaches the conclusion she does. She presents with the references. So anyway, it's really good stuff. Yeah. And for those just listening, her substack is called Let's Be Clear. It's really quite excellent. It really is quite excellent. Um, so anyway, what she discusses in here is all of the little threads of evidence that suggest that uh, at the very least antibodies are not the um, the end all and be all of immunity to COVID. And she goes through some evidence that I was frankly unaware of. Now that I've seen her explore it, yeah, I would have I should have wondered if the, if the evidence existed in this form, but of people who can't produce antibodies for one of a number of reasons, either because they're on a drug that is suppressing their production of antibodies, mm -hmm. or they have a congenital defect that causes them not to be producing antibodies. And as she correctly points out, the fact that these people are not doomed by COVID mm -hmm. means they are successfully fending it off, which implies a whole other system that is not captured in the, oh my God, it creates a great titer of antibodies. Um, so anyway, those who are more deeply knowledgeable about immunology will spot at least one of the other components of that system, which is that um, we basically have two kinds of circulating cells that manage this very specific kind of immunity, right? Uh, that is an adaptive immunity that learns to fend off a pathogen, right? We have B cells. B cells have receptors on them, and they produce free-floating antibodies. And those two things have a relationship. So when a receptor is triggered by an antigen, then the release of antibodies occurs in at least many cases, whereas a T cell produces no free-floating antibodies. It has receptors, it gets triggered, and they create lots of other phenomena. They can, for example, uh, people will remember our discussion from, I think, last week, and many other times, where we discussed the question of what happens when your own cell is producing not only your own antigens, but is producing foreign antigens, well, that cell gets destroyed. The body destroys it, and it destroys it using T cells. These T cells identify this compromised cell. They, In any natural case that I know of, a cell that is producing foreign antigens and self-antigens is an infected cell, and so killing it is the way to get rid of it, right? It's bad to kill your own cells, but it's better to do that than leave them in place. So anyway, you've got these two different systems. And so the fact that the B cell antibody-based immunity is not the sum total of COVID immunity clearly is evidenced by... The I mean, it, it is never, right? For any, for, for any illness, for any pathogen response, is it ever entirely B cell well, antibody-based? Well, there will be things that are primarily B cell... So, for example... And what are the conditions that uh, predict that? It's a good question. Um, this is off the top of my head, having mm -hmm. uh, studied this many, many years ago and, you know, as an undergraduate in a medical school class. But nonetheless, it's been a long time and uh, the field has grown and sure. I've learned a lot during COVID that I didn't learn back then. But, uh, but, for example, if you had a bacterium, right, you might... There's some bacteria that you might fend off by just gumming them up with uh, antibodies that would then cause them to be consumed by macrophages, right? That might be the go-to mechanism. And because the bacterium is not getting into your cells, T cells might be uh, none of the response or not primary. Um, so, you know, I hesitate to say anything uh, in absolute terms in biology, because as as my advisor and and uh, member of your committee, Dick Alexander, would always say, he's like, you know, that's the quickest route to be wrong, yep. because biology, you know, he, he used to make this point about insects that anything you think never happens in animals, check out insects, you'll find right. it's there somewhere. Yeah. Um, well, it's it, it seems like one 
trend that for which there will be exceptions will be that uh, single acute exposure to something uh, might be your body might launch a successful immune response uh, entirely or almost entirely with B cells and eradicate it. And if you're not exposed to it again, like you, it's it's gone. Right. Now, this is actually covers one of the things. So my purpose today is to actually just get people used to hearing about this because I have a feeling where the conversation is about to go is, hey, is this antibody stuff really what we've been led to believe or is it being used to mesmerize us when there's a larger conversation that might say something very different, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And so um, one thing that is the case Right. People have a, I, I am now understanding, people have a misunderstanding in their mind about antibodies being the result of either uh, natural immunity developed in response to infection uh, or, um, um, or a vaccination. Acquired immunity from a vaccination, for right. instance. And what this misses is that, in fact, and forgive me if you've heard this before, but there is a system that has a rudimentary set of cells that are not highly effective at attacking any pathogen they haven't seen, but have a basic ability to attack anything that isn't self, right? And so the point is, it is wrong. If what you've got in your mind is, oh, I need something to create antibodies, and I'm not going to have that until I've been infected with the pathogen, or I've gotten a vaccine, let's say a classic vaccine that does this well, that's not really right. What happens if you get infected with a pathogen that you have never seen before is a process of evolution is triggered inside your immune system. And what literally happens, and I believe it is the most interesting biological fact I am aware of, but what happens is your cells, be they B or T cells or both, literally evolve. They evolve on the time scale that pathogens evolve. And they do so, what they do is they take that crude ability to uh, electromagnetically attach, right, or to be triggered in the case of a receptor. Um, they take that crude ability and they refine it. And the way they do this is through something called clonal selection, where those that tiny subset of your immune cells that is triggered by some pathogen you've never seen, right, it induces the cells that produce either that antibody or has those receptors on its surface to diversify, to produce daughter cells that are not alike. They are actually programmed to be not alike. And then that fraction of the daughter cells that is best triggered then produces its own daughter cells. So you get this rapid pattern of evolution, right? It's a confusing language, but it's called clonal selection. Well, not, I mean, it, if you know... If the daughter cells are different, uh, it's it's and you have in your head what most people have in their head about what a clone means. Ah, uh, it's confusing language. Well, it's actually a little bit like our uh, many earlier discussions about why chromosomes are not the end all and be all of sex determination, even in humans, where sex is determined through chromosomes. Right. Mm -hmm. and the point is, you we tend. We notice the pattern, that there is a chromosomal pattern, that men tend to be XY, women tend to be XX, and so strongly so that we tend to want to synonymize them. But as you point out, um, the real, the, the, the thing that really is not a broken pattern is that and there are two... far more ancient than genetic sex determination. Right, is the gamete size, which actually dictates what is male and what's female. So mm -hmm. the shortcut of saying, oh, it's the chromosomes, gets you in trouble. And in the same way here, mm -hmm. the idea that clone means identical, right, is not right. What's actually happening is you've got um, an asexual process that has a random number generator triggered in it in order to get diversity. It's a cheat to bypass sex as a mechanism for producing diversity, right? So it really is clonal, and it really is selection. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, Peter Medawar was one of the pioneers here. Peter Medawar, who I believe got the Nobel Prize, he's a British biologist, got the Nobel Prize for discovering the basis of graft rejection, mm. right? Graft rejection being the result of the fact that if you take a organ from somebody who has your blood type so there's no big antigen incompatibility and you transplant it into you well it still isn't self 
right? They've spelled all of the proteins differently. And so your immune system will attack it, right? And yep. so getting a match, uh, a molecular electromagnetic match for you is important, which is why it's so hard to find a donor, right? Somebody, ha somebody has to die who has that match before you get an organ that you're not going to reject. But in any case, okay, so you've got these cells that are capable of uh, evolving to get better. But what that means is that you have the rudimentary cells, the library, the crude library of, you know, it's not the super refined tool that fits the thing just so. It's the adjustable crescent wrench that fits it kind of, right? It's that kind of thing. But that isn't nothing. In fact, mm -hmm. it's keeping you alive, right? That thing, which is always surveilling for looking for hostile pathogens to get the place to start the process of evolving a good response is ever present, right? And so anyway, the antibodies and that response is always available. It's just not high quality. And the thing that vaccines do, and now I'm talking about good vaccines in which nobody would argue that they're anything other than vaccines, what those things do is they provide an advanced warning. Right, they provide a description of the uh, of the the hostile entity in advance, so that that process of learning the molecular signal, the electromagnetic signal of those antigens, can be done when you're not sick, right, or minimally sick in the case of a uh, of a attenuated virus vaccine, mm -hmm. right? So you do that work when you're not challenged by the thing, and then you run into the thing. It's like, oh, I already know how to beat that. And in fact, I'm going to beat it so I've got quick. a head start. My immune system has a head start on you because I haven't seen you before, but I've seen something like you enough that I'm ready. Right. And so mm -hmm. presumably the, we are constantly being invaded by viruses and other pathogens right. for which we already have the formula, and we, we never get any symptoms because we beat them so quickly, right? And so that's how it's supposed to work. But don't get the idea that you don't have the immunity until something, either the infection or uh, a vaccine, gives it to you. That's just not right. Well, but I mean, it, it is also true that quite possibly some of why so many people are so sick right now you know, oh, the triple threat, right? It's SARS-CoV-2 and flu and RSV. Like, well, okay, but why are so many people so susceptible this year, right? Because we just spent a long time in effective, in many places for many people to varying degrees, in social isolation, wearing masks, you know, basic, you know basically preventing ourselves from being exposed at low level to things that kept our immune systems in, in the process of sort of priming themselves. So I hear explanations like this. They are plausible. I am not certain that they are true. They could well be. I want to be a little bit cautious about it. It feels related to me to the hygiene hypothesis, right? The hygiene hypothesis, which is that we are keeping our homes, we are, we are clearing our homes of all possible you know, bacteria and other pathogens. And children raised in such homes end up with a higher level of allergies and susceptibility to things like the common cold. And so this, I, the hygiene hypothesis does not specify a mechanism, but it feels like it goes in exactly the same direction. So I, I feel like the, um, the burden of that, that's not true. The, you know, the fact that we forced everyone to socially isolate and wear masks and such for years uh, is not contributing to uh, a higher responsiveness to low-level and not-so-low-level viruses and other pathogens now. I think the burden of proof of that is on the people who are saying it's not. So I, I think there are multiple things that may be contributing to the same pattern, or at least are viable hypotheses. Mm -hmm. um, what you and I would call confounds and what kids today and doctors call confounders. But anyway, um, so to put a couple of them on the list, A, the hygiene hypothesis and the version of it that would apply to this, <clears throat> I think is almost certain to be true uh, during development. In other words, mm -hmm. the immune system during development gets exposures that are useful. Um, the question of whether or not adults are getting sick with these things because of a couple of years of increased isolation, certainly plausible that there is a kind of um, censusing of the pathogen environment in which you're basically low-level vaccinating yourself. And I've heard doctors talk about this. Um, 
Zach's pediatrician when he was a, a baby uh, used to talk about... His, his good pediatrician. His yes. good pediatrician. Uh, I think his name may have been Peterson. But um, in any case, he uh, he used to talk about the fact that he didn't get sick and he attributed to that... He, the doctor. He, he the, the doctor. pediatrician, didn't get sick, even though he's coming every day into a practice with a lot of young, sick kids. Right. right. And what he thought was going on, right or wrong, was that he was being exposed to all, you know, the kids are all snotting up his office and um and he's exposed to this stuff and basically in a, he's constantly up to date on the library of what's out there mm -hmm. right so that's possible other things that are possible is that there's evolution on the pathogen front so we had a year with almost no flu right right now maybe that's bullshit maybe flu ended up disguised as covid because the powers that be wanted to count it that way but if we take the lack of flu at face value, mm -hmm. I think it's pretty clear why that would have happened, right? We did something that interrupted our normal ecology, which interrupted its ecology, which is suddenly the mechanism that it uses to infect people to is transmit. broken because mm -hmm. it's not, doesn't have access to airplanes and, you know, indoor restaurants and all of the stuff that we weren't doing. And so... Well, I mean, the, the, the obvious prediction here, of course is that in places that, that stopped the lockdowns early, that didn't have the social isolation and closed the schools and such, there won't be as much of a surge uh, right now in respiratory viruses. Probably, except that we except are all travel. intermingling. Yeah. Exactly. And so, you know, I do wonder, if you, if you take a pathogen and you suddenly accidentally get wise to blocking it by, you know doing some draconian antisocial distancing, whatever it is, and the pathogen responds by turning up uh, its infectivity, right? Because now it has to jump gaps mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. it didn't have to jump before, that yeah. that suddenly at the point you stop doing that could unleash a surge. Right. But so I, either way, we created an environment that might uh, produce conditions to encourage the evolu evolution of virulence. Right. And at the same time, what did we do with these so-called vaccines is we intervened in a complex system that nobody knows enough about to have done this. And we did so in a way that is now obviously dumb um, and in a way that is now we are seeing evidence of weird consequences that nobody predicted as far as I know, like IgG4, the attenuation signal, suddenly rising in people who have been multiply boosted. And the question is, well, that does a couple of things. That, A, causes a suppression of immunity for the thing for which these folks were, or potentially causes a suppression of immunity in the case of the pathogen for which they were boosted, but it also provides a... Uh, a loophole in the immune system that right. other pathogens can find right. their way it's through. not specific it's right. just it causes an overall dampening well it's like if you um if you were running a military operation which i'm not no thank you um but if you were i think i could do okay I mean, I I'd, I'd, want, I'd, want to, I'd want to study in advance. Let's put it I'd this way. I want to talk to a lot of good people, but we know some of those people. The T's would be crossed. The I's would be dotted. That oh, probably... come on. <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> I was that about... That's not what I do. <laughs> I was about to say, uh, before I was so rudely interrupted, I was about to say that that would likely result in a great decrease in friendly fire incidents. Okay? Now, what I was going to suggest is a crude mechanism... I see. Um, a crude mechanism for preventing friendly fire incidents uh, that uh, presumably militaries use is some sort of a, hey, I'm a friendly transponder signal, right, which causes... We're talking some... about the immune system now. No, we're talking about an actual military <laughs> operation, um, which neither of us are in charge of. But mm -hmm. uh, the point is, if, you, if every tank that is yours is putting out a signal um, that is, you know, heavily encrypted so you can't, the enemy can't put out that signal itself, then you could prevent uh, the targeting of those things. But to the extent that the enemy figures out how to do this, right, to get access to the code and creates uh, a transponder of its own, then the point is that's a loophole for anything that they can put that transponder on. Wait, is this all like a way to circle back to Codecracker, our new nope. superhero? You think? No. no. I don't have a pun. I'm working on it all okay. the time, but I don't have one. Um, but anyway, po 
point is that ITT4 thing uh, suggests another mechanism that might be causing us to see a, an uptick in these pathogens. Um, so anyway, that's three different things that all point in the same direction and make it hard for us to know uh, if, you know, which, if any of these things or possibly all of them are in play. Um, okay. The other thing I wanted to talk about was that inside of this discussion about antibodies, we have now started discussing different classes of antibodies, right? We discussed IgG, which is the primary antibody uh, thought to be responsible, at least in the case of SARS-CoV-2 and probably most viruses um, for neutralizing these things. But uh, that is what is induced by the early uh, inoculations. The problem is, and many people have now raised this in different ways, that this is not ideally the kind of immunity that you want to stop transmission of this thing. And it may be that at some level the very design of this vaccination was doomed from the start not to stop transmission because it's in the wrong place, right? Your uh, lymph can be full of immune cells that are well alerted to this pathogen, but if your mucosa aren't brimming over with antibodies that identify the pathogen as soon as it lands, it can still get into your lungs. And so um, the way to think about this, the way to, to listen for it, is that the antibodies, the class of antibodies that are responsible for mucosal immunity is IgA, not IgG, right? So um, anyway, and you may also have heard of IgE, which is the one that paradoxically seems to produce nothing but trouble, right? It produces allergies, right? Places where you have an immune reaction to stuff that is not a pathogen. And um, that's not good. You can, in fact, be killed by your own immune response to something that is not a pathogen, like a bee sting. Um, you'll be overwhelmed with your own uh, inflammation. Yeah. I wonder if it might not have been in, a, in an earlier era when we weren't able to travel with such magical alacrity, a, uh, a measure of localness. Uh, of, you know, if, if, if you are now being exposed to something at 10 or 20 or 30, especially, or 40, uh, that you've never been exposed to before, uh, maybe you have strayed into territory where other things are going to be new as well. Hmm. Interesting. If it would, if you would take it as some kind of a, a proxy for something. Mm -hmm. um, interesting. I hadn't thought of anything like that. Quite possible. It's an um, aside. Yep. Uh, but yeah, actually, you know, it sort of fits with um, the discussion of the repulsion that people, the physical revulsion that is sometimes felt mm. about uh, foreign stuff. And oh, I, I thought you were going to talk about sick, sickness. Oh. Well, but mm. that, you know, <laughs> let's put it this way. Um, amongst racists, mm -hmm. the belief that the other is not only, you know, an economic threat or a military but threat, dirty. but dirty, disgusting. Mm -hmm. right. um, so anyway, mm -hmm. who knows? Maybe there is some, some history that would explain that, and it's not uh, just... Um, a trick, a propagandistic trick. Yeah. In, in, just an aside that yeah. I know you're, you're still talking about IG, uh, IG, A and G here. Um, but one of the places where that script gets very much flipped is in the European arrival <clears throat> on the eastern coast of North America, where both Europeans and Native Americans who they interacted with perceived <clears throat> um, that the Native Americans were very clean and the Europeans were filthy. And what the hell's wrong with those people anyway? Yeah. The Europeans. Like, what, what is wrong with those Europeans? How can they live like that? Right. No, it, it, it is true. And yeah. then, of course, you know, um, at the point that the Europeans were landing in North America, the game was already in some sense over as a result of the pathogen that had spread due to early contact. Um, but, you know, clearly at some level, the Europeans were a pathological threat that they mm -hmm. didn't even presumably understand. Yeah, um, right. Which is a fascinating and very, very tragic story. Um, back to immunoglobulin. Yeah, back to immuno immunoglobulin. So uh, immunoglobulin is just a synonym for antibody. Um, and it's what the IG stands for. And yep. IgG, IgA, IgA. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and you should know, so this would be better done with visuals, although most of our 
followers are just listening anyway. But um, the the fact is these antibodies, which you have seen diagrammed a million times as little Y-shaped proteins where the tips of the Y are the thing that sticks to the antigen and then the tail is what dictates what class, IgA, IgE, IgG, etc., um, the antibody is... Um, in, but that thing has a close evolutionary relationship to the receptors that sit on the surface of the B cell. So you can imagine if a B cell is producing antibodies and those antibodies find their target and they land, that doesn't tell the B cell that produced them anything special. They're not, you know, in contact. So there have to be receptors on the cell itself so that the cell itself knows, ah, wait, it's my time. It's like the bank guard who, you know, spends an entire career sitting in the bank where nothing happens. And then finally the robber shows up and it's like, ah, that's what I've been training for, right? Um, so anyway, the receptors on the, you know, the T cells and the B cells have an evolutionary relationship. They're not independent, right? These are two versions, they're variations, the evolutionary variations on a theme. And the receptors and the antibodies have a relationship and anyway, therein lies the, the story. But that's probably almost enough to, to cap this off for today, purpose being really just to get people used to the conversation, since I think we're about to end up talking about whether this campaign made any sense in the first place. You know, did This campaign, meaning this kind of uh, treatment that was sold to us as a vaccine? Yes. What, what campaign? The vaccination campaign, okay. right? Creating IgG immunity in your lymph and blood was that ever did anybody think that that was going to arrest the uh the progress of this pathogen and if so by what mechanism right you know an iga response in the mucosa might have blocked transmission and there's a way to induce that which is to produce the um, pseudo infection or the attenuated infection in the mucosa where the mucosa learns this lesson instead of your lymph. Um, Which is to say a different drug and delivered differently. Right. A, a, a nasal vaccine of a traditional sort. Right. And I will say, you know, yes, we will be ex uh, accused of conspiratorial thinking. On the other hand, we've seen an awful lot of collusion just to obscure the truth. So I don't know why we would uh, draw a line. But um, there is an aspect in which there are several different lines of evidence that, you know, pharma was very excited about this platform and it's easy to see why because once this platform is something that people accept then producing the r&d is just slashed like you know you get it takes it takes no time at all which was one of the selling points right, right. like wow we are so lucky that we got this so fast and you know you you have a chance to replace literally years right. of r&d and then i mean i don't i, I don't know how it is that uh, they are going to continue to justify clinical trials being abbreviated uh, like they did. But, um, you know, years into less than a year is going to be quite a remarkable cost savings. Well, if they hadn't created, if the vaccines had been less destructive than they turned out to be, or if they had been better at controlling the story so mm -hmm. that people thought they were less destructive, then... The answer is, oh, well, this new platform requires a whole new regulatory structure because why would you spend decades when the only thing you're swapping out is a sequence, right? Yeah. So you can see their argument, right? You yep. can see them, you know, frothing at the mouth, frankly, at the <laughs> profits that they're going to generate by trans translating every vaccine into this new platform and just, you know, shooting you up. Um, so it didn't work out that way. Uh, and hopefully people are awake enough or enough people are awake enough that, uh, you know, we'll say two brief things here. Yeah. One, to understand that as fantastic as the potential of uh, inducing the production of uh, proteins using uh, transfection with mRNA, as much as that has tremendous potential, A, we don't know that it can be done usefully, and there's a basic safety problem that is going to accompany every single attempt. And the basic safety problem is you're going to make the patient's cells produce foreign antigen, and that is going to get them targeted by the patient's immune system. And unless you have some really sophisticated way of keeping that damage to some tissue where you can afford it, it's game over, mm -hmm. right? It's not, it's not worth it. And so um, anyway... To my way of thinking, um, 
that's where the conversation has to be. Have you solved that problem? If so, tell us how you've solved that problem. And we'll talk about whether or not what you're saying makes any sense or if it sounds like PR, Mm -hmm. right? Um, But until you solve that problem, uh, well, you've just seen a totally predictable disaster. um, And we're not doing that again. So hopefully. Um, So anyway, it's, it's, it's that question written over all sorts of vaccines that, you know, that they basically want to change the process on. All right. Last thing is I wanted to point out that uh, in this discussion about um, antibodies, antibody immunity, whether antibody immunity is the, um, the best kind of immunity that one might uh, want to induce with a, a vaccine campaign, um, there is also this interesting paper that showed up in Nature. I only briefly saw it before we went on today, but it's clearly relevant. Um, Zach, do you want to put on that uh, that paper? Uh, yeah. Um, so this is a report. This is Nature. Um, and it talks about something which people who have been watching Dark Horse for some time will remember you and I talked about earlier, much earlier in the pandemic, the possibility that there might be hybrid herd immunity that comes from some people uh, having received their immunity through an inoculation, some people having uh, that immunity through uh, exposure to the pathogen, and that really were the inoculations good at producing a uh Uh, an immunity to contracting the disease that you could get there by a combination of those two processes. Well, I haven't seen this paper yet, um, but it looks from just what I can see of the abstract here that they at least looked at not just antibody response, but also T-cell response. Yep, they did. Now scroll down, Zach, if you would, towards the end of the abstract. Um, it says, it says full vaccination was crucial to provide hybrid immunity. Among right. Things. What you have to say if you're going to publish in Nature. Um, uh, however, when designing vaccine strategies, T cell exhaustion after multiple vaccinations should be considered. This is literally the first time I've seen this paper. Yep. Have you seen it enough to know on yep. what basis they are saying? You know that that what? looks encrypted. That looks encoded to be like okay, we had to say these things, and we're going to be a little bit cryptic here. But what did they see? What did they that s- made them conclude that you know T cell exhaustion after multiple vaccinations should be considered? Which like given the way abstracts are written now on this topic, that sounds like this is what we found. But we only are able to say maybe this. Right. right. What they saw was a substantial drop in. T cell reactivity after multiple boosts mm. by the vaccines, and the reason that so I IgG4 raise IgG four and T cell are dropping. Uh, IgG four is increasing, which is an oh, attenuation yeah. signal. So yeah, the the <laughs> right right. <laughs> I got a sign problem. I got to keep track of the signs. But yep. IgG four is increasing, which is causing a drop in uh, responsiveness. Right, and, and separately, T oh, cell responsiveness is dropping in multiply inoculated people. Now, the implications of that are likely to be complex, hard to parse. But one thing at the level of the discussion that we've just had, what this looks like is that these particular inoculations, whether the people who designed and or produced them knew what they were doing or not, seems to be dragging the Uh, battle against SARS-CoV-2 in those who have subjected themselves, at least to the mRNA uh, vaccination campaign, dragging the fight into the realm of B cells and antibodies and away from T cells, Mm -hmm. right? Now, people who have studied viruses are liable to be alarmed at that because viral immunity over on the T cell side is likely to be superior. And so, This is yet another variation on a theme. Didn't see that exact result coming, but we have talked about things like uh, original antigenic sin. Original antigenic sin means that once you've given the immune system a potent message about a particular pathogen, the immune system loses its objectivity. It loses its creativity, and it becomes tracked into making that first response that it made. And that is not a good thing, 
right? You want the immune system to be dynamic, to be capable of switching gears if it needs to, and tracking it into this uh, one response is not a good idea. So that's original antigenic sin. There is antibody-dependent enhancement, in which a pathogen uh, utilizes the antibodies that it can predict are going to land on its surface as a mechanism for gaining access to cells that it would not be uh, otherwise able to do. And, you know, now we've got attenuation signals, right? Attenuation signals uh, are not in either of those categories exactly, but does seem like uh, a consequence of something analogous to original antigenic sin. Um, and now we see T cells uh, standing down. That's like, you know, is that a consequence of an attenuation signal? What is it? Right. But in any case, it's... Uh, it is so many different demonstrations of what you and I said very simply without um, any specificity at all, right? Welcome to complex systems. You are intervening in a interaction between a pathogen and the immune system. That's one complex system inside of a person. That's another complex system inside of a society in, in, in a pandemic. Okay, that's, but, but but that description, and we have said that multiple yeah. times, by that description, so too is any vaccine. Yep. Right. So any any vaccine is going to actually have those three layers of, of complexity yep. um, that, that is true about it. And, you know, what isn't included in the rendering that you just gave is the novelty up upon novelty upon novelty. I think there's at least three um, in the mRNA vaccines. Yep. Like, you know, there, there are at least, well, yes. So it's the mRNA um, being used to effectively turn you into a factory for the antigen. Yep. It's the introduction of the pseudouridine into the mRNA so it doesn't decay. Yep. And it's the lipid nanoparticles uh, that are coding the mRNA so that they aren't found by the uh, RNAs, yep. right, um, in the intercellular space to to also not let them decay. So all all three of those things, and I'm I'm sure there are many more than that, but those are the three that come to mind. Like, oh, this is this is so novel with no track record. Right. Um, so I will just put an asterisk on that last one. The lipid nanoparticles are in and of themselves uh, novel, and who knows what their consequence is, but the, the lack of a targeting mechanism so that whatever they're doing is just happening all over the body is a critical design failure. Right. Um, but I agree with you. It, the nested complex systems are always there. It's the intervening with something novel and thinking that you know what's going to happen. Oh, no, you don't right? The best thing you can do is you can work in a f way that is close, is closely enough, is similar enough to something you've done and seen the response and hopefully tracked the consequences over the course of decades following that gives you some confidence that this works. But even that we've seen, we've seen traditional vaccines fail, right? You've seen them introduced and we've seen safety signals cause them to be removed from the market. And so the point is that's not foolproof, but at least it's something. Yeah. Right. And here, what they did was an absolutely, at least triply novel intervention in a nested series of complex systems where, you know, it was just obvious that they weren't going to be able to predict the outcome. And, you know, it is much worse than it might have been. Uh, so far, it's not as bad as it might have been. You know, it's arbitrary in terms of its level of terribleness. But, it, it, you know, it, it was very unlikely that with that level of novelty in that level of complexity that their hopes were going to be mirrored by the consequence. And we, we've seen them uh, embarrassed, or at least they should be embarrassed at, uh, at what actually happened. No, I don't. I don't see any evidence of embarrassment. Honestly, um, <clears throat> we are seeing more and more suggestions uh, that it is not as uh, those who are actually trying to help humanity would have hoped. Uh, yeah. But the evidence of embarrassment on behalf of uh, those who pushed these things, I don't see. I don't see it. Um, except that, actually, the Department of Defense has rescinded the vaccine mandate for the military. Uh, which is important in about time, and <clears throat> I don't I don't have anything in particular 
uh, to to say about this, but you know, but but just a few a few a few details, which is that there seems to be, and uh, I hope to hear about it if this has already changed, or I hope it will change. There seems to be nothing in uh, the I don't remember if it's a declaration or whatever, um, but in the in the new paperwork uh, that helps in any way those uh, those members of the military who were relieved of duty because they wouldn't get vaccinated. I think those those people are still. Um, simply as screwed as they already were by uh, a uh, unethical and unreasonable mandate. Um, but for those people who were still, uh, you know, hoping for an exemption, who had a black mark on their record, but were somehow managing to still be in the military, uh, all of those things are supposed to now be be wiped clean. Which, you know, it's 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 about time. And uh, we we talked. I looked it up in. Um, Dark Horse number 112, we're at 157 now. So this is uh, closing in on a year ago. Uh, we discussed the widespread abandonment of mandates in government and the private sector. About a year ago, early year 2022. Ago. Yeah. Um, but uh, really three, two large sectors were keeping them, and there's a third that was that was keeping them partially. And one of the large sectors and the third one are largely still in place. So, you know, this week... The military drops the mandates. Terrific. Fantastic. Good job. About time. Uh, but in the entertainment industry, as we have talked about before, uh, it still seems to be uh, de rigueur to require mandates and to be, to be up to date, you know, whatever that means, uh, to be up to date on all of your shots, even for children. Okay. And then the other place before before we talk a little bit about this is uh, not all of higher ed, and it was never all of higher ed. It was remarkably the elite institutions, and it just it's such a perfect a perfect encapsulation, really, of what has happened here. That it was the elite institutions that early on started uh, mandating vaccines for its students. For its young people, in, you know, who are most at risk from these from these vaccines and at least risk from the actual virus, and it is them. And then you know later on, some other institutions sort of joined in the mandate game, um, but most of them have backed off. And it's the elite institutions who still have them for a tremendous number of people. And uh, you know, isn't isn't that it right there, the, the, the nugget, that it is the elite institutions throughout this that have revealed their failures to understand basic logic and science and to care about humanity, both of those things, simultaneously. So why are we still listening? So I um, tweeted something on this topic earlier uh, in the week, and I think, and it leads to the um, piece of the puzzle I wanted to at least uh, float today. For some reason, we are living in an era in which regulators regulate only after the public has become alarmed about something. In other words, they're supposed to be regulating so that the public doesn't have to become alarmed because it's pretty well protected. But what's happening is the level of harm has to be great enough that the public can't ignore it. And at that point, the regulators will step in and reluctantly regulate, right? The vaccine mandate in the military is being dropped late after public discussion about the consequence of this for our readiness. And it's including right here on Dark Horse. You did, you did two fantastic conversations with uh, service members and, and one lawyer. Yep. Yep. Um, and... So what is the meaning of that? You've got the Department of Defense that is dragging its heels on dropping a mandate that is crippling military readiness. They should be the first people to look out for military readiness. They should be sensitive to threats to military readiness. Most of us don't even understand. Mm -hmm. And then in this case, it's, it's the public discussion that is driving them to do that. Likewise, we have newsrooms, right? Newsrooms there now, you know, the Washington Post and the and the Wall Street Journal are now reporting on the possibility that the vaccine campaign may be driving the evolution of variants. Really? I mean, so what we've got is the newsroom is now um, 
embarrassed into reporting the news. That's what's going on, right? It's all of these things are lagging. And you're pointing out that the elite institutions, which are the people, you know, every faculty on in one of these elite universities should be brimming over with people saying, hey, wait a minute, this is a complex system. What are they doing? Lipid nanoparticle? How are they going to prevent it from getting into your heart? Every one of these institutions should be full of people who know enough to raise the right questions, to point to the right historical instances that reveal the danger of doing this kind of well, thing. Not after decades of uh, the creation of fictional departments and fields uh, such that many people on the faculty can't tell up from down. Or two from two from four, like, right? You know, if 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 they're if they're going to engage in sophistry at the level of two plus two might not equal four, then asking them to consider the risks of complex systems upon complex systems upon complex systems, especially when presented by people with all the credentials and the right, you know, glassware and lamp coats and such, and who are using big words that you know just you know, follow the scientism uh, and think, oh, yes, I will, because I know that in this house we believe in science. And, you know, it's, it's, it's effectively loyalty oaths all the way down. And, you know, I'm, I am loyal to science. Like, no, you're not. You have no idea what science is. That's not what science is. You're being lied to. Oh, and it's over. Right. Um, it is upside down. Yeah. Right. All of these things. And here's what I'm concerned about, though. If you think about the... Uh, military mandate being dropped and you think about people discussing what just happened 10 years from now the discussion whether you understand that the dod allowed military readiness to be crippled for years before finally abandoning this policy right that's going to depend on your ability to tell 2021 from 2023 Right. That's a minor difference when you're looking at history. And it really erases the immense period of time in which we were shouting at them and saying, what are you doing? Military yeah. readiness. We're supposed to be able to fight two simultaneous wars on two different fronts at once. And you're dicking around with this stuff. Right. You're taking pilots out of the air. You're grounding them. What are you doing? You're supposed to be defending the nation. And so, you know, I I'm already dreading the arguments five years from now when we're looking back and it, you know, the ability to make the argument about the jaw-dropping insanity of what we went through comes down to, you know, the last digit in a four-digit year, right? And, you know, whether or not, you know, the Wall Street Journal was aware of the variant issue in, you know, 2023 or 2021, right? That's a huge difference. How much happened in those intervening years? It was a ton. And they could have been talking about this. It wasn't hard. We were talking about it, right? They presumably have access to YouTube. They could have figured out that this was a question. So mm -hmm. I'm concerned that what's happening is that we have successfully, we, the whole community of dissidents, has successfully embarrassed the system into having to do the bare minimum years late. And that that is a tremendously important story, but that it will look like a footnote, right? Oh, government's slow. Right. So anyway, I, I don't know how you prepare people that that's the cover story they're building. But by doing all of these things late, they're um, covering their asses and leaving us exposed to doing this all again. Yeah, they are. Meanwhile, uh, just show my screen very briefly here, Zach. Health and Human Services uh, posts. I am over here. Oh, it's, it's oh. unplugged at so many levels. Not at my computer, though. <laughs> Due to circumstances entirely under our control. The, exactly. So Health and Human Services publishes or posts the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response this week, four days ago, as we're live streaming January 11th, renewal of determination that a public health emergency exists. All right. So we got another 90-day extension on, yep, COVID is a public health emergency. This is, I think, the 11th one. Um, uh, as a result of the continued consequences of the coronavirus, coronavirus disease 2019 pandemic on this date and after consultation with public health officials as necessary. I, Xavier Becerra, apologies if I'm butchering his name, Secretary of Health and Human Services, pursuant to the authority vested in me under Section 319, etc., do renew effective January 11, 2023, the January 31st, 2020 determination by former Secretary Alex Amazar that he previously renewed on, and then they go through all, every 90 days literally you could 
tell time by it. It's like clockwork every 90 days. So we just got renewed three days ago for another 90 days that this is a public health emergency. Which is its own hall of mirrors. Yeah. Because they use these things as, as an excuse. On the other hand, um, I wouldn't even know how to call it. Well, so let's take a look briefly, if if we can, <laughs> if my computer will show, um, at, and I'll, I'll link to this, declarations of a public health emergency, what beyond the 11 with regard to coronavirus, to, to COVID, have happened recently? Well, we've got one um, oh, also recurring every 90, 90 days, the opioid crisis. Hmm. I didn't know that. Okay. I'm not exactly sure what to think of that, but okay. Oh, monkeypox, November 2nd. Okay, maybe so. Then we've got the hurricane in South Carolina on September 30th, the hurricane in Florida on September 26th, the hurricane in Puerto Rico on September 20th, severe storms flooding landslides and mudslides in Kentucky on August 2nd, wildfires and straight line winds in New Mexico. So we've got punctuated natural disasters that are serious and that cause real pointed moments in time when people were at risk and there needed to be an immediate response on the part of HHS, presumably, and other agencies. And this whole list is has those occasionally, and then mostly it's every 90 days, yep, SARS-CoV-2, uh, medical emergency, opioid crisis, medical emergency, and now maybe it's going to start with monkeypox as well. So it's like, it's like inuring us to... You're always in a state of emergency. Be be afraid. Be very very afraid, and you know make sure that you are on high alert at all times. And you know you don't need to actually know anything about physiology, or about psychology to know that being in a state of high alert at all times is not good for you. You make poorer decisions. You are more likely to be confused and more able to be confused by those who would like to confuse you. So th this doesn't feel accidental organic yeah it does it, it doesn't no i mean it might be organic it does, but it doesn't it feels like we are being led into a state of perpetual i mean it's 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 like the the color coding of <laughs> after after 9 11 yeah. right of like you know if you're at yellow or orange or red you know you're you may be about to die like oh my god really i can't live like this well yes but let us help you <laughs> yeah, like this this is this is no way to live and this, 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 that's been the case since they started this 11 90-day intervals ago. Yeah. It was 10 90-day intervals ago if this is the 11th. But It's like, so you know this Rahm Emanuel quote, never let a good crisis go to waste, right? It's <laughs> like that thing um, has run into the same um, safetyism obsession that is riddled through everything else where you know i i really wish people would look at the covid phenomenon beyond the pandemic and they would look at what it implies about what our system is but the real question is if we you know how many different ways is what we are going through a self-inflicted wound Right. What you are pointing to is here's a psychological self-inflicted wound. We've also got a lipid nanoparticle, pseudouridine-enhanced mRNA self-inflicted wound. And then you know what else we have? We have a spike protein-encrusted nucleocapsid uh, SARS virus, SARS-CoV-2 self-inflicted wound, mm -hmm. which is the result of its own panic over zoonotic viruses, which we absolutely have to enhance in the lab so that we'll know what to do. What kind of bullshit argument is that, right? This is all people, you know, basically jerking funding mechanisms around by the amygdala, right? It's just <laughs> like, you know, we better study this now or we're all going to... Really? That's what you think is that suddenly the danger of a virus leaping out of a bat in a cave is so great that we have to enhance that virus and never mind all of the prior cases in which viruses have escaped from labs where people had them, right? I mean, the story is just too dumb, but somehow people who have enough precaution in them 
to prevent us from overreacting are not allowed into the conversation. You're only allowed into the conversation about pandemics if you're panicked about the chance of one leaping out of a cave at any moment. And what that means is this self-inflicted wound was inevitable. Yeah. Right? Be anybody who didn't think that this was enough of a problem or that you were going to make your problem worse by enhancing viruses in the lab wasn't welcome. And holy moly, are we paying a huge price for, for this kind of, um, you know, it's like it's like some insane field trip where everybody is leaping out from bushes and shouting in each other's ears all of a sudden. I, you know, it's everybody's keeping each other on edge because that allows them to, you know, manipulate the system into spitting out money. Or... Is that something to, that occurred to you on field trips? No, I was trying to think of what context <laughs> this would happen. It didn't sound like a boardroom to me, but, you know. It doesn't sound like any field trip I know. No. Do we have a better event that... Where people leap out and try to startle each other. How about now? <laughs> well, about right. This All here right. and now. Yes, because that that is that is the point. It's 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 what they're doing. So um, in that in that milieu, mm -hmm. uh, what condition is the American Academy of Pediatrics now suggesting the remedy of drugs and surgery for? What what Ooh. condition? What childhood conditions? The American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, I'm going to read. This is not from the uh, AAP, the American Academy of Pediatrics, although I'll, I'll link to that. But CBS, among everyone else, reported on this. So I'm going to just read the first three paragraphs, alighting the condition itself. Okay. okay. Children struggling with this condition should be evaluated and treated early and aggressively, including with medications for kids as young as 12 and surgery for those as young as 13, according to new guidelines released Monday. The longstanding practice of watchful waiting or delaying treatment to see whether children and teens outgrow or overcome the condition on their own only worsens the problem that affects more than 14.4 million young people in the U.S., researchers say. Left untreated, the condition can lead to lifelong health problems, including high blood pressure, diabetes, and depression. Waiting doesn't work, said co-author of the first guidance on this condition in 15 years from the American Academy of Pediatrics. Can waiting talk, doesn't work. Can we talk to the person who said waiting does work? I just think that both the arguments should be on the table. Um, so you've probably heard this story. I haven't. You haven't? No. Oh, so do you so you want to take a guess? What I'm, condition? I'm reasonably confident I know what the condition is, okay. and it's a killer. Yeah. It's a killer. Um, the condition, tell me if I'm wrong, mm -hmm. is that some kids in this era where Frankly, there are a lot of kids with a lot of conditions. Mm -hmm. Some kids don't have a condition. And not having a condition... <laughs> Wait, there's 14.4 million children in this country without a condition? That seems high, but... That's terrifying. Uh, well, right, but well, drugs imagine and surgery. how they feel. Exactly. Mm. Drugs and surgery. Because you can... I mean, do you pick your condition, right? You could decide what To condition. the operating theater with them. <laughs> exactly. So is that it? Uh, lack of condition? Lack of lack of any uh, diagnostic Lack of condition. any diagnostic. Anything yeah. wrong with them? Exactly, which would make them feel like the odd man out at school. Drugs is not too young. Or woman or... No, not drugs is not too young. Drugs is... 12 is not too young. <laughs> drugs is... <laughs> and I am not on any at the moment. That was a uh, brief <laughs> moment of channeling George W. Bush. God. Is the kids learning? <laughs> um, yeah, 12 is not too young for drugs if no. your child does not yet have a problem. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Drugs didn't work. Try surgery. <laughs> so, how how I mean, close did I get? Unfortunately, you got really far. Okay. You weren't anywhere close. But you know the the language the, the, when you allot, when you take out the name of the condition, the idea you know children struggling should be evaluated and treated early and aggressively, including with medications for kids as young as twelve and surgery for those as young as thirteen. Now the the ages aren't quite the same. But this sounds like the same thing that they're doing with regard to trans, mm -hmm. right? This It sounds like that. Uh, and yet, in this case, um, it's not It's not trans. It's obesity. It's being overweight. It's the, it's the actual health problem of being overweight. But, but what they're recommending is drugs and surgery right. for 12 and 13-year-olds. And here's some other good quotations from, this, from the CBS story. The co-director of the Center for Pediatric Obesity Medicine at the University of Minnesota said, Obesity is not a lifestyle problem. It is not a lifestyle disease. It predominantly emerges from biological factors. <laughs> because until yesterday, there were this many overweight and obese kids in the world and are still outside of the countries that 
feed our kids complete garbage? No. This this is I cannot believe that a a doctor whose job this is is willing to go on the record saying this. Like have you met doctors? <sighs> Sorry. Unfortunately, uh, um, a few like this. And the medical director for the AAP, again, the American Academy of Pediatrics, Institute for Healthy Childhood Weight, and a co-author of the guidelines said, this is no different, this is not different, it's, you know, she was speaking, so that it's not quite grammatically right, but this is not different than you have asthma, and now we have an inhaler for you. Which, fascinating, right? Like, why are there so many childhood allergies now? Why are so many kids asthmatic and allergic to things? It's because of what we're doing to them. It's because of what we're feeding them and because we keep our houses too completely clean of pathogens and yet we're feeding them garbage and we've got pollutants everywhere. Adjuvants. And, and adjuvants. And the obesity is the same thing. Once, you know, once you're 30 and obese, and you have been since you were young, it's really tough. Like it's it's likely that you're going to have a very very hard time getting getting to a weight that would have been considered healthy for your height uh, if if you had not been obese your entire life. But children, you you don't start with drugs and surgery for children. You don't do that. No, it's it's insane, and it, the pattern is there for every one of these exploding pathologies. Right? You've got. You know, we have talked extensively about the the orthodontia version of this. We, there is obviously something that we have changed about the environment of children. Genes doesn't make any sense as an explanation. So it's mm -hmm. obviously something that we are doing. And the implication is, if it's something new that you're doing, it's something you could stop doing. Right. Right. Um, now, in the uh, in the case of obesity, how insane is it? that we're going to studiously pretend that the right thing to do is drugs and surgery for children who, frankly, maybe it's too late for them, but it's not too late for the children who haven't been exposed to whatever it is yet. And we are not, here's what we're not going to do. We are not going to go after the ability of corporations to study the psychology of children and to induce them to eat more than they would otherwise eat and eat different things than they would otherwise eat. As if that's not an obvious suspect in the, the question of why childhood obesity is rising, right? Mm -hmm. we, are, we are actually allowing corporations to induce children into self-harm, right? This is as bad as allowing them to molest children, right? You are, we are harming children. They will, their whole lives will be affected by this. And we are not looking at the obvious culprits that we could obviously do something about without touching the kids, right? You could just simply say, look, yeah. I mean, I, I've made this argument not for just for food, but I don't think advertisers should have any right to advertise to children. They shouldn't have the right to study children, right? It is our obligation to protect children. We don't have any control over the ability of an advertiser to get into a kid's mind. Why are we letting them do that? Yep. Right? You wouldn't let a stranger on the street who, you know, was trying to con your kid to talk to them. So mm -hmm. why are we allowing them to do it through screens? It makes no sense. No, it doesn't. Uh, I cannot show my screen. Is that right? Okay, yep. that's fine. Uh, the clinical practice guideline for the evaluation and treatment of children and adolescents with obesity is an interesting document. I have that's that's the thing that came out this week that everyone's reporting on. Um, I haven't read all of it, but just just the little blurb at the top of the page reads the first sentence: 14 million U.S. children are affected by the serious and complex chronic disease of obesity. How would you define disease? Yeah, I don't think I think that actually just worked, Zach. I saw my screen jump around. Yeah, I bet it did. Um, I don't, metabolic disease, right. like in adults having had a, you know, a developmental period during which they were taking in a lot of sugar and synthetic crap and, um, no, you don't need to anymore. Um, and, uh, and 
you know, becoming less active and, you know, their, their physiology changed with their diet and activity level through their childhood and adolescence and upon becoming adults. Metabolic disease may well be the right term here. And I didn't actually look up disease, what other people think disease means, but um, this strikes me as, you know, the complex, serious and complex chronic disease of obesity. That, I feel like part of what that is doing is once again encouraging people to uh, take the control away from themselves. Well, I can't do anything. I couldn't make sure I get out in the sun every day and get and synthesize my vitamin D and move my body around and make choice learn learn by making repeated choices about what I eat to love food that is also good for me. Well, I can't I can't do anything. It's easier if you just give me a pill. It's much easier. And if I hear that it's a disease that I've got, then that changes the conversation. There's nothing I can do, it's a disease. As opposed to, you know what, you're a kid. And you are not, this is not your fault, but you can still take responsibility. And your parents should definitely take responsibility. And <laughs> they should keep you away from the doctors who were looking at these guidelines as much as possible. So. At some level, it's just a charade, right? You've got an industry selling food that has a a perverse incentive. You've got an industry selling pills, which has got a perverse incentive. You've got an industry selling surgery that's got a perverse incentive. And there's no industry uh, of leave kids alone in a healthy environment that doesn't make them sick, Right. right? They don't have lobbyists. There's nobody on that side. And so the thing that is increasingly infuriating to me is the pretense that this is about science and medicine and study and consternation about illnesses that children are suffering. It's not, right? This is somehow about business. And the problem is Mm -hmm. the people doing it don't even know that, right? I'm sure even in pharma, they go to work and they think, well, there's a biological problem called obesity in children and by gum we gotta address it with some some molecules right Mm -hmm. um and there is nobody i mean like you know there used to be medicine right used to be doctors who had a scientific bent who solved problems who puzzled through what was making their patients sick figured out what things might work for them and there were things like a second opinion, right? Maybe I don't want a medical establishment in which every doctor agrees to what the CDC said. Maybe I want two doctors to disagree and I want to listen. No, but it streamlines the process because there's no need for a second opinion because you know the second, third, fourth, and nth opinion will all be the same. Therefore, you don't need them. Right. No. So it, it does mm-hmm. streamline the process. Hey, doc, these check boxes. what do I take, right? Mm-hmm. It's that. There's also essentially no... Advocacy. I can't remember the last time I heard anybody say that an ounce of prevention was worth a pound of cure. Because, you know, an ounce, yeah. an ounce of prevention is a breach of the fiduciary responsibility to shareholders, right? Prevention. How are you going to monetize prevention? Treatment. That's where the shareholders get for their, their value. Pharmaceutical companies, not for doctors. Well, right? even doctors running a practice who encourage. Uh, whatever they're called, they're like the regular healthy checkups or whatever, yep. like, you know, or an- annual exams even, but also just, oh, you know what, uh, you know, you're pre-diabetic, you're pre like this, you're like, it, it, it would be great to just have a sit down and have a face to face, you patient, me doctor, every six months. Like, you know, that, that doesn't sound like a breach of fiduciary responsibility, whether or not the doctor is working for a hospital or their own practice or whatever. Like if you're encouraging you know, encouraging patients to come in for office visits and actually develop a relationship with them. You know, are they going to be sicker sooner and therefore require more drugs? No, but that's a good thing. Right? Well, I agree with you. There's no doctor corporation. And I'm sure what I don't know about how HMOs and all of that work, you know, is uh, is a, a place where a lot of stuff can be hidden. Yeah. But, um, but at the very least, 
the doctors are captured by something that has fiduciary responsibilities that we don't understand yeah. all over the place. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, this pandemic diagnosed the system, and the diagnosis was, you know, it's got a terminal illness, right? And that terminal illness will cause it to reverse the labels on cure and poison, mm -hmm. right? And once you have a medical establishment that's willing to do that, whether it's because of threats or perverse incentives or confusion, right? The point is, well, okay, that's not medicine in the sense that we used to think of it. It's something else, right? Uh, pharma isn't in the business of making people healthier, right? It's not surprising that pharma figured out that that's not where its, but its bread is buttered. So, you know, what are we going to do? Because, you know, it's a great and tragic example that you've, you've brought to us here where we're going to pretend that an epidemic of obesity is not about external inputs to the system having changed in a way that has overwhelmed restraint in children or overwhelmed metabolism or whatever it did. It predominantly emerges from biological factors said the co-director of the Center for Pediatric Obesity Medicine at which, the University of Minnesota, which is both true at a trivial level and so far misses the mark in terms of what a doctor in a position like this needs to be thinking about and must know. Must know, right? And you do find in the guidelines, you know, mention of like nutrition, healthy lifestyle, uh, but, you know, the big thing that made the headlines and that's new here is uh, recommendations specifically identifying the youngest age at which you should start on drugs for 12-year-olds who are obese if everything else has failed. And surgery for 13-year-olds who are obese if everything else has failed. And I'm not even sure the if everything else has failed language is in there. I, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, but I'm not even sure right. that's how they've framed it. Okay, but... We've we got to separate these two things, right? Because it comes up in every one of these cases. Mm -hmm. They're the people who have already been affected, who may indeed have a permanent problem, a developmental right. impact on their metabolism that causes them to have a lifelong issue that we have to deal with somehow, mm -hmm. right? And then they're the people who haven't been hurt yet, an indefinitely large group, right? All those who have yet to be born, who when they are born will either be exposed to the factor that made these other kids fat, or they won't, right? And so... We haven't hurt them yet. The amount of good, you even if you were stuck with a bad situation for kids that have already been affected and there's nothing you can do for them that really works, the amount of good you can do by not doing it to anybody else is, is indefinitely large. And so why aren't we focused there? And why, I mean, even that statement that you read, can you describe a scenario? I'm not asking for something that is really true. Can you describe a scenario in which an obesity epidemic in children is not primarily happening with biological factors? I mean... It's a fat suit. <laughs> it's a fat suit. It's a, it's a mirror with a bow in it, right? Yeah. Those it's a, are not, it's a, it does feel like a hall of mirrors. It feels like a hall of mirrors. Maybe it's all halls of mirrors. Maybe there are no obese kids and it's just a, an illusion. But short of that... You know what obesity is made of? Lipids, right? You know how lipids get into the body? Metabolism. You know how metabolism happens? You eat stuff. You know what you eat it with? You masticate it with your teeth. And all it's all biological. biological. All the way down. Right. Yeah. What else would it be? Right? They, the person has, has like put on a lab coat and said a tautology, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's wise. Well, but I mean, it also, I mean, this, I mean, we, we could... There's a whole dissertation to be had in unpacking this really ridiculous statement that seems so simple and was said with such assurance. Obesity is not a lifestyle problem. It is not a lifestyle disease. It predominantly emerges from biological factors. The first two sentences in that three-sentence statement are not true for right. children. And um, you know, once once you're stuck in it, it likely is. Um, but the third sentence, it predominantly emerges from biological factors, is a non sequitur, which is placed at the end of these other two sentences as if it is a rejoinder. No, it's not a rejoinder, it's a non sequitur. They're different. They have no relationship to one another. 
Obesity does stem from the crazy hypernovel lifestyle that we have pushed actively on everyone for the last n years. I don't even know what to call it, right? But you know, it, you know, starting sort of I don't know starting, but you know, ramping up after World War II. How about? Yep. And it predominantly emerges from biological factors. Oh, that does sound science. Yeah, it sounds. Okay, science-y. well then, oh, well, let's do science then. Oh, a pill. Uh, which factors? Which factors? Uh, well, for example, uh, the big gulp. Uh, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> Another big thing is like the Mac. <laughs> the big Mac. Yeah. yeah. So look for uh, alphabetically. A lot of the factors mm-hmm. are under uh, under B. <laughs> <sighs> okay. Yep. Slight change of topic. No less maddening. But less. Well, maddening. all right. Okay. Though this is good. I'm already pre mad. Oh, you so, are. You're yeah. pre maddened. Yes. Pre maddened. Okay, um, you have presumably heard, although you hadn't heard about that one, that the USC School of Education and Michigan's Department of Health and Human Services both came out publicly against the use of the word field. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. Field, field, field. Okay. Um, Here we go. Um, <laughs> <laughs> wait, are we talking about sports or are we talking about disciplines? Disciplines and offices and, yeah. Yeah, you can show my screen. This is the U.S. I said field yesterday, and you told me this was going to come up. Yeah, that, yeah. that was not okay anymore. This it, is the it USC. It does not properly honor uh, people who live in forests and on coastlines. Field. The um, I don't even know who she is. The someone. Oh uh, no, this is the name of the school. <laughs> Sorry, the School of Social Work at USC has sent to everyone associated, the community, the faculty, staff, and students. As we enter 2023, we'd like to share a change we're making at the Suzanne Dvorak Peck, Dvorak, I don't know, that's not how you would spell Dvorak, doesn't nope. matter, um, <clears throat> School of Social Work to ensure our use of inclusive language and practice. Specifically, we have decided to remove the term field from our curriculum and practice and replace it with practicum. This change supports anti-racist social work practice by replacing language that could be considered anti-black or anti-immigrant in favor of inclusive language. Language can be powerful. And phrases such as going into the field or field work may have connotations for descendants of slavery and immigrant workers that are not benign. Oh, my goodness. Give me my my screen back. Sorry, man. Um, And uh, the Michigan, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. So that was private university. This is now the state of Michigan. You don't show my screen. I just got a quote here. As an agency, we will be discontinuing use of terms like fieldwork and field workers. Instead, staff can use terms like community office, local office, and community local office staff. Also, yes. <laughs> this week I propose to you that we not call gibberish that is actually directed and not indicative of a schizophrenic break word salad, but word soup. That's word soup. Yeah, that's some hearty word soup. Yeah. Um, here's the question. I understand that that is a weapon <laughs> that you could use against somebody speaking the English, right? Like if you were to just try to say something, then the chances that you will literally have missed a memo that tells you why you're not supposed to have used that term for this thing, right? Chances are near certain. So... Presumably. Yeah. And I've seen no declar- no explanation beyond a little bit more than what I've shared with you here. Presumably, this is about the historical use of the word field to distinguish between house and field slaves, I think. Wait, wait, wait. And, you know, and slave isn't the word that was used, right? <laughs> but if that is the case, which, I, which is the best I can do, like this is the best I can figure in terms of like how this word comes to be in the line of the firing squad here certainly house is equally bad right e- equally dangerous or no no uh, hurtful 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 you, you must to, have missed that memo um yeah apparently but i mean really the, but, I mean, it's, it's, the yes. point is as you speak you can be certain that you are in violation of a memo mm-hmm. somewhere right? somehow yeah. which will not be a problem unless something decides that you are inconvenient, in which case it will become a problem. 
It's a low posted speed limit. It is. It it's, is a low posted woke, woke version. Right, and and all of their little traps are this way. Mm-hmm. But what what is impossible to imagine? First of all, this isn't how language works. <laughs> so, it just isn't how language by works. By fiat. Right, by fiat. We and, won't be using the word field anymore. Right. Or the word fiat. You, you have know a problem why? with that? Or the word fiat? Yes. Because it's a also a car? Like, well, I don't know what. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. Italian, Mussolini, <laughs> trauma, something, right? Um, but uh, So, I mean, we also, mm-hmm. like, We've been field workers, right? Like we 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 are field we're field biologists. We're not um, community office biologists, right? Like we're field biologists, as distinguished from lab biologists, not as distinguished from house biologists, because that's not what you do in biology. It's field versus lab, and that doesn't have a history of racism. And no, I don't. You can't say lab. You know why? <laughs> why? Um, because of Labrador. Which is the stolen island land. Or the do- island? Island? The uh, province. Yes. Yes. No, no. Well, it's stolen land. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, look. I, I, I believe the kids call this problematizing things. You turn them into problems. Mm-hmm. You can, we can turn anything into a problem. And, and the we can, point we can, is... We can go all day. This is really about the power to put out the memos that then allow you to dictate who is no longer allowed to talk. But what is inconceivable is that anybody could be keeping track of all of the things that you are not supposed to say. I mean, maybe if that was your full-time job... You could keep track of the things you're not allowed to say. Well, the problem could... in part is that it's many people's full-time jobs to come up with the damn memos. Right. Clearly. It's an arms right? race. You've got, you got DEI offices everywhere now, and they're sitting around twiddling their thumbs because they were hired on false pretenses. And, you know, at Stanford, which we talked about a few weeks ago, and at USC and at Michigan Health and Human Services, they're like, oh, I know. I'll be, I'll be proactive and come up with a job. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to outlaw a word. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> My work here is done Yes, I'm for, until tomorrow, <laughs> at which point I'll figure out the other words that I need to outlaw. Right. And the offices don't, they're not in good communication. So it turns out that silence is violence and speech is violence, which doesn't leave you a lot of room. No, it's, not like, it's, it's again useful because you can go after anyone Anybody anytime. at any time for anything they might be doing or not doing. Yeah, don't say that. And how and dare you not How dare you? Speak yeah, up. your silence is deafening, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. It's that world. But can you imagine for a second? The prototypical person who is trying to be good and not offend anybody by not using words like field or house or whatever the next problematized word is going to be, right? Okay. So you are filtering everything you say so that you don't trip over any of these words by speaking in the way people normally speak where they don't parse everything in advance, right? Now, imagine that that person has another job. Are they able to do that other job while they are so busy looking at every utterance to see whether or not there has been a memo that says that they're not allowed to say that thing? My sense is if you did this, if you took that seriously, that's all you are, is yeah. not going to do that thing. So yeah, um, that, that becomes your full-time job. That beca- Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you probably, probably won't be able to do it even then, right? Especially if the memos keep coming out. Um, <laughs> You know, and uh, oh, it's 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 like um, uh, we recently talked about in oh God's sake I can't remember uh, the World War Two book um, long okay <laughs> <laughs> you, you oh uh, I should know yeah no I, I'm just drawing a complete blank um, doesn't matter all right well uh, suffice it to say this needs to be studied and that's going to require a field. Yeah, I mean, there there was a lot more I wanted to say here, but let's let, let's move on. I just I, when we talked about the Stanford words, yep, you could kind of imagine what they thought they were up to in each of the cases, and they, it was everywhere from silly to egregious. But you, you know, one of my favorite ones was like, you shouldn't use the word seminal because you know it's. It makes people think of semen. I don't like, but like it, it right. you know, it, it, it unfairly genderizes stuff, whatever. Um, 
at least there's a like a there there like that's stupid don't stop it but you know at least you can sort of track back like oh i, I guess i see what they're doing right the, like have they literally never run into anyone who works in the field who does field work who like I, I I just fail to grasp how they could have ever left, like the bedroom that they grew up from and spent their entire childhood on social media. Presumably, like well, it feels it feels so narrow and so I, I, so I, atrocious a life to be to be putting out memos like this. Right, it is. It's it's an empty empty existence. But it catch twenty two. That's the novel that's the one. Of. Yes, yes, it's some catch. Well, no, it was, it's the, the, when the guy keeps coming out, the memos and the memos and the memos and no one oh, can the, keep uh, up. the great loyalty oath campaign. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's that thing all over again. It's that thing. Yeah. But look, this once again, of course, is sophistry. And imagine for a second that the game was, that it was an analog of the social media game, right? Where the idea is, can I put something out on a social media platform that gets engagement or anger or reposted or whatever, right? And to the extent that you can't, you are shouting into a void. It's no fun. It's frustrating. And to the extent that you put something into the world that makes a ripple, you get a little something, right? So now imagine that you have a serious bureaucracy that is, its purpose is to protect Stanford so that Stanford will continue to stand indefinitely, right? And the point is you can use your own demographic markers to introduce anything you want into the conversation to see if you can make them jump, right? And it's like, uh, you know that word field? It's not a good word. You know, there are a lot of us out here who every time we hear that, we are traumatized. Do you know why? Uh, well, of course we do, but we'd like to hear you elaborate on this. Uh, yeah. yeah, field, right. Now explain the problem of field. Well, do you know where slaves worked? Uh, oh, got it field memo right and so how cool a game is that that you can get the i mean in a world in which you are otherwise unempowered right disempowered because uh the world is crazy and maybe also because you have no skills uh you know what a power rush sure what a, what a rush to be able to affect change well like this. <laughs> <laughs> okay but but let's just some of these people are just monsters. Mm -hmm. But some of these people... Most pe of them aren't, though. Most of them aren't. But yeah. you can imagine. I mean, look. Okay. Let's take all things pandemic. Okay? Whatever else is true, whoever you happen to be, you were just served so poorly by the civilization that, you know, taxes you and regulates you and all of this. You were just... You, you were... The, the level at which you were protected was beyond abysmal. Right? Mm-hmm. And you have no power to affect change. There's nobody to vote for, right? It's just like endless monotony and trying not to, you know, go to jail. And the point <laughs> is... <laughs> hmm. Well, <laughs> I guess my point is I can imagine... Look, the distaste that the dysfunction of our civilization would naturally produce in anybody who was paying attention is liable to have an outgrowth. And if the outgrowth is, all right, I mean, you know, the class clown, right? The class clown has figured out something that's at least interesting, right? The class clown has figured out that maybe there's nothing for him in that room unless he yep. can turn that room into a comedy opportunity and then that's it that's amusing you can get a room full of people to laugh and then you can watch the teacher pull their hair out and you know so it's that kind of thing and i can't it is it is that kind of play yeah yeah and so i look i hate the monsters who don't care about the harm that they do to innocent people but i understand the person who is bored and annoyed that they have been given no good path to anything useful and expected just to suck it up, right? Mm -hmm. I understand that person looking for opportunities to, you know, for hijinks. And to the extent that that might be hijinks, I don't know. I well, and that's, I mean, to take it back a little bit, that's part of why, I guess, mostly in the summer of 2020, we were coming down so hard on the Ibram X. Kendi's and... Uh, 
whatever her name is, white fragility lady. Um, uh, Crenshaw? D'Angelo? Oh. Uh, no, uh, D'Angelo. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, Kendi, who wrote Anti-Racist, or How to Be an Anti-Racist, or Anti-Racist baby, baby, or all of those uh, things, <laughs> right? Um, and, but both both of them, yeah. from their different perches as, you know, a black man and a white woman, uh, were, you know, proclaiming racism everywhere and uh, the need for, effectively, reparations in every single moment of every single day for every single human being who can't claim to have been oppressed in this one very particular demographic way. Yep. Right. And it just it opens up this apparent avenue for people who never would have seen it as an avenue and wouldn't have been encouraged to take it. But for the fact that suddenly in especially in an era when there's so little opportunity and so much is falling apart, it's like, well, OK, I, you know, I'm smart enough i can get stuff done and i've got this one little demographic marker of some sort and you know it doesn't have to be any number of things and guess who is hiring all the dei offices mm. because everyone's got dei offices now yeah it's an affirmative action program a cryptic one well but i don't no i'm actually i'm not no that's not that's not what i'm saying at all it's it's you funnel you you encourage people and this is part of what i've been saying about part of what the you know the the trans rights activists are about you know as opposed to like the you know very very rare true trans people but you know trans is on the rise in part because it's the one of these demographic markers that you can opt into and just one day you're like yep that's me and now all you know all those same dei offices that are you know the only the only people they're not open to are you know straight white dudes who were born dudes and they're still dudes right and you know that's you know less than a majority and you have a, a, i would say it's not affirmative action it's a jobs it's program. a jobs program yeah, yeah. it's a, it's a make work jobs program mm -hmm. right there's no real work to be done right we all understand that a colorblind society is desirable and that we're not quite there and but you know it's not like you need people to studiously figure out what to do about all of the interactions and words that people might say without permission and all of that but the problem is, the problem is um it's it's exactly analogous to the postmodernists right that by providing a foot in the door for postmodernism the postmodernists were incubated and became postmodern activists that took over the universities and by creating a DEI program the point is oh well they sure are going to find some stuff to complain about because that's what effectively what you've appointed them to do well and once it exists uh everyone will work to try to ensure that their job stays relevant enough for them to keep a job yeah and so you know and this is something we've been talking about since since evergreen blew up right like you don't um it's very hard to convince people whose profession professional position is things have always sucked, things continue to suck, and things will not stop sucking. That, oh, actually things are getting better and therefore we need less of the constant talk about sucking now. Because well, what am I supposed to do then? That's what I do. That's what I, I, talk, that's what I do is I talk about how awful everything is. So I am actually um, not maybe even able anymore to see that things in some realms are getting better. Because yeah. that would put me out of a job. Right, right. Well, Can we talk about fish? <laughs> We've been talking about fish mm -hmm. for the whole time. Puffer fish. Oh, good. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Zach is going to show this video and um, sound off. Although I think there's um, subtitles, but you don't. You just 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 watch, and I'm gonna we're gonna talk over it. So this is a. <clears throat> I'm gonna talk even though there's words on the screen, so you're gonna hear it or me, um, and you can choose. So in 2014. This pufferfish was named, uh, and uh, it was 1995. Uh, this is these are these are found off of the uh, I think it's pronounced Ryukyu Islands in Japan, between um, just north of Taiwan. And uh, the Ryukyu Islands, incidentally, which has a lot of really interesting stuff in it, and I'd like to go at some point. I'm just okay. just a just a point of order here. Is there a geological reason that they are uh, interesting? 
I don't know. Um, um, Biologic, I, I, it looks, it looks like a, a rift edge of some sort, but I, I know very little about it except when I went to find, figure out where these pufferfish were, and I found once again yet another fascinating, you know, animal behavior story that I was interested in. It's like, oh, it's in the Ryukyus. I'm like, again, okay, what's going on there? I don't know. Anyway, uh, in I think I said the 19, 1995, scuba divers had been noticing these underwater circles. Um, and didn't know to what to attribute them. And it was a long time. It was um, a couple, almost a couple of decades uh, before, uh, in 2013, uh, a, a paper in Scientific Reports came out called Role of Huge Geometric Circular Structures in the Reproduction of a Marine Puffer Fish. And so here it is, it's zooming out now. You can see like this this animal has just made this incredible thing. It takes him, I think the BBC said so two, like two weeks. Oh, but it, yeah, the, the scientific paper says seven to nine days working just constantly because of course this isn't, you know, not tides change what he's building here. So it, it's a he. It's a he, <clears throat> it's a he. And uh, the behavioral description of what's going on actually came before the scientific name of the fish. So the, that's just an interesting little little glitch, right, in the usual order of things where we didn't even know for sure that this wasn't a species that had already been named and was just doing something different than its, you know, its kin elsewhere uh, until after the behavior was described. And is that replaying? Yeah, so we can, we can stop now. Um, so... Males are spending seven to nine days. It's always males. Wait, wait, wait. Question for you. Yeah. Do we know its mating system? I don't see any evidence of it. But, well, no. I, 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 I can tell you what little I know. And, and we can predict it. Well, yes. Uh, so males spend seven to nine days actively making and tending these nests. And there are at least three characteristics of these nests that are heretofore unknown otherwise in fishy fish, in ray fin fish, actinopterygians. Uh, and... Uh, I mean, there's a lot of fascinating fish behavior, of course, as as, as we've talked about a little bit, but as many people will, will know. Um, but those radially aligned peaks and valleys outside of the actual nest site, um, no one's ever seen fish do that before. Those placing of the shell fragments along the peaks uh, is new in fish behavior. And then the fine sand particles gathered in the nest site, which you couldn't necessarily see, but maybe you can infer having now seen the big geometric design from on high, that they specifically are are moving the sand around to create a central, what ends up being the nest, of very fine sand. And um, those three things, the peaks and valleys outside, the shell fragments on the peaks, and the fine sand in the middle in its own geometric but slightly more regular pattern, are all constructed and maintained before mating, before a female ever shows up. Sure. Female shows up. So wait, wait, wait. I want to predict the stuff before you. Okay, I don't. I don't know very much, but uh, yeah, go for it. Um, so it's going to be a polygynous mating system. Not clear. Well, I'm going to predict that it will be a, that males will invest nothing in that. If that's a male, they will invest nothing in offspring beyond gametes. Yeah, and I think that's not true. Not true. So yeah. that's part of why I want to do this is yeah. see whether the system is any different because. You know what it of course looks like is a an aquatic bowerbird analog. Mm -hmm. exactly. Are the circles near each other? I don't know, uh, and I don't know if my read was uh, incomplete or if it wasn't described. Um, they are after the females visit the nests. The nests mostly collapse. And then they get so the the eggs are laid on fine sand, and then they're covered with coarser sand. And it's it is likely, it seems to me, um, that the fineness of the sand increases fitness of the eggs. So wait, wait, wait. These are the locations where the eggs are laid. The middle of that area. Yeah. So you've got the radial arms outside of the center. Like yep. imagine it's sort of like a daisy. The middle part ends up like a daisy being the actual reproductive part. So that's very unlike the bowerbird example. Yeah. Okay. Well. Um, in in some ways, in some ways, um, but yeah, it, I mean, it is it's it's kind of it is very much actually like a daisy. It hadn't occurred to me before, so but then, you know, in terms of you know, the petals are basically the the lure from afar uh, for 
you know, not other daisies, but, you know, the, the vectors, the pollinators, um, to come and pollinate. And it's the center thing. It's the center ring um, that is where the eggs are actually laid. So then it might not be a polygynous system. This right. might be a mysteriously valuable structure. And, well, and it's, it's mysteriously valuable. It starts collapsing in and of itself quickly. I think... Um, that there is, there are a few days of sort of male tendant, uh, attendance, so male parental care, and then he goes and builds another one, and uh, it's it's off it, and starts over from scratch once the once the first one. So it 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 may be actually a promiscuous system in which um, you know if if you have built the careful nest and you can attract a good mate, that's great, and you have that one thing, and then after that, whatever it is, a few weeks. You can go and and build another. Yeah, so this is actually potentially closer to your frogs, um, where a male might have multiple wells. I see. There's no description in what I found of territoriality, uh, and that's not to say that they're not. I would expect that they are. I see no description of therefore uh, the quality of the substrate, right? Uh, you know what what determines where where the fish choose to to build these nests and mm -hmm. um, and aesthetic structures around them. Well, one thing that's likely to be true is that structure is likely to be very difficult to build and maintain if there are currents. And actually, you can uh, you can just put it back on while we're talking, as long as we're talking about these guys. Uh, yes, and I think they're in s slightly deep water, but yes, there are currents, and this is this is exactly true. I think I said this already that the maintenance of the structure is needs to be constant. That basically, as soon as the maintenance stops, the stops thing it, the thing decays. Which you would kind of expect, because if the male, if n neither of the fish are going to defend the thing, then what you don't want to do is call is signal potential egg predators right. that this is a structure so you would want it to kind of break down but it's like these what are those like uh giant like buddhist sand art oh i was thinking that too right actually. Yeah. that take i don't know like weeks months maybe even to create and they're gorgeous and intricate and then the, the point is in part that they get wiped clean yes, shortly after yep. they are completed um in that case, there is not a, um, a reproductive motive. So, so what we are looking at seems to be either some new kind of system or one of two known kinds of systems. It looks like a bowerbird kind of scenario, but that doesn't sound like bowerbird behavior if the eggs are being laid there. Yeah, and it's unlike... So there, there are what something less than 20, I think, species, something around two dozen-ish species of bowerbirds in northern Australia and, and Papua New Guinea. And there's different there's different things that the different bowerbirds do. Yep. Um, but they, they build these structures uh, that females, the males build these structures that females are attracted to, uh, but they have some permanence to them. Yes. And they do, you know, they do decay. It's the tropics, and 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 they steal from each other. The male bowerbirds steal from one another, and uh, but they're in a spot. They are territorial of the spot, and they build a structure on the spot, the bower. And that spot is a spot that any female can come back to over and over again. And unless something has happened, um, she knows that if she's in that spot, it's going to be that guy. Whereas uh, except these, they steal bowers, they, they do. But the these are these do not appear to be. Um, Territorial. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's why. That's why I think the the bowerbird connection is superficial. I was wrong to go there. I mean, it, it looks like it, and the shell part of the story. You know, I'd be curious whether they steal shells from each other, something like that, um, and whether there is a display. Well, I, so the thought I had about the shells was the the functional part of this is the is the center of the daisy, right? Yep. It's it's the nest. That's where the eggs are going to be. And my guess is that the eggs are actually somewhat fragile and they need a very soft, very finely grained sand nest. And the sort of the petals of the daisy, the petal, the, the, the would-be petals of this of this structure that he's building are the visual attractant from on far, but the shells he's pulling from inside the nest as be. an indicator of I've cleaned, cleaned the area. It. Yep. It's it's clear it's clear of the debris that would Im negatively impact your eggs. Which is reminiscent. That is again reminiscent of bowerbirds and maybe even more so birds of paradise. Yes. Right. The cleaning of the dance floor uh, is a 
I don't know if it's universal, but it's close um, mm-hmm. for for all of those species. Um, and you know, you can make a lot of arguments for why that might be. But I think mannequins too. I think mannequins clean their clean their um, little dance pads in those that have flat pads as opposed to sticks. Maybe not. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm more familiar with the stick dancing uh, mannequins, but. Um, but anyway, interesting because you've got features of multiple terrestrial systems. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd be very curious to to know what's actually going on here. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we should get to the uh, Ryukyu Islands and uh, right take now? a look. No, I, no, I got no. For one thing, it's probably very cold there right now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I think we've been at it quite a while. Yes, we have. And uh, maybe we should stop for this week and come back in a week that's not prime Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah that's gonna happen soon yeah and uh, we will take a break and then come back and do our Q&A so you can ask questions at darkhorseemissions.com that's that is open now you can ask questions there Uh, you we encourage you again to go to our patreons if you want to join the discord community or ask questions for our monthly Q&A you can find that at my patreon and um and yeah lots of other good stuff maybe that's it for now until we see you next time be good to the ones you love eat good food and get outside be well everyone